فعاش القلب إخلاصا وصرت تحومك الطير تحلق في ثقافات وتنهل من روبا الخير السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم in the name of Allah سبحانه وتعالى most gracious most merciful الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين we praise Allah سبحانه وتعالى we thank him upon all conditions we send blessings and salutations upon Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم his household his companions we ask Allah سبحانه وتعالى to bless them and to bless every one of you and your offspring to come up to the day of Qiyamah, may Allah bless them. Say Ameen. You must be wondering, I'm not yet married. How are my offspring going to be blessed? MashaAllah. Don't worry. When you say, may Allah bless my offspring, it is an all-inclusive dua to say, may Allah give me the best spouse and then the offspring and then bless us all. So just say Ameen. Alhamdulillah. My beloved brothers and sisters in Islam, have you ever sat to think who exactly you are you might say yes I did so who are you I'm a human being have you ever thought what is the meaning of the term human being Adami in Arabic it is called Adami why Adami do you know why because Adam alayhi salam was the first of human kind the first species Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the first of this species was Adam alayhi salatu was salam. We are called Adami because we are the family of Adam. Okay, what a beautiful, beautiful way to begin. The reason I start this way is because many of us forget that we are actually related. We are actually related in many ways and we are part of one huge family. يا أيها الناس إنا خلقناكم من ذكر وأنثى. O people, we have created you from a single male and female. In سورة النساء, Allah says, يا أيها الناس تقو ربكم الذي خلقكم. الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة. O people, be conscious of your Maker. Be conscious of the One who made you. He who made you from a single soul, from one soul. Speaking of Adam alayhi salatu wasalam, and Allah makes mention of this in many places within the Quran. Do you know what Allah subhanahu wa taala says? وَلَقَدْ خَلَقْنَاكُمْ ثُمَّ صَوَّرْنَاكُمْ ثُمَّ قُلْنَا لِلْمَلَائِكَةِ اسْجُدُوا لِآدَمْ Allah makes mention of the beginning when we created you, when we fashioned you. Fashioning meaning we gave you your identity, your shape, we gave you your posture, we placed all the organs in the place that we knew was the best and then Allah says we told the angels to prostrate to Adam Adam was the first and you and I know that everyone prostrated besides Iblis Iblis who was the devil why did he not prostrate because he said Ana minhu. I am better than him I am better than this creature whom you have created O Allah from this I learn that when I don't acknowledge the favor that Allah has bestowed upon others, I have developed a quality of the devil. The devil was he who did not acknowledge the favor of others that Allah bestowed on them. People make money. Did they steal from you? No. So keep quiet. Thankful to Allah. Be thankful to Allah. Someone is more knowledgeable than you. Don't be jealous. Someone is better looking than you. Don't be jealous. And by the way, we're all good looking. Subhanallah. We're all good looking because it is so unique that the taste that Allah has kept of what is termed good looking within the hearts and minds of people differs. You might look at someone and say, Ooh, beautiful. And someone say, what? 
What? In the English language, they say one man's meat is another man's poison, but I will not say that. The reason is it's not meat and it's not poison. We're talking of looks. Mashallah. You might argue that I already said it, but I said I didn't say it. Okay. So don't be jealous at what Allah has given others because Allah has given you something unique as well. You have something you might not know it. You might not have recognized it, but Allah has favored every one of us in our own unique way. Amazing. Some people are extremely intelligent, but they're not wealthy. Some are wealthy, but guess what? They haven't really had qualifications. Have you ever seen that? You find some people very rich and he'll tell you, I just dropped out of school at grade seven. Have you heard that? See, the yes means in Kenya, we have some of those, mashallah. But alhamdulillah, it goes to show that education and sustenance are not necessarily connected, although we have to work hard and we have to rely on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why do I start this way? I start this way to show you the diversity that we have. We have the wealthy, we have the poor, we have those who are extremely intelligent, those who might not be upon that level. And when I say extremely intelligent here, it's also speaking about those who pass their O and A levels and secondary school examinations at the beginning, the first time, and those who had to repeat it twice or thrice before they passed and those who did not pass, but they were dropped out for some reason. You are never a drop out from the mercy of Allah. Remember that. You are never a drop out from the mercy of Allah. Just remember that. Bear that in mind. And in the same way, I want the mercy of Allah. I need to understand that the rest of the people here are my family members. Wallahi, I was seated in front of you for a few moments filled with love for everyone. Wallahi. I was thinking to myself, these are my brothers. These are my sisters. I may never know you personally, but guess what? You have a place in my heart. The reason is you are my family. What was my great grandfather's name? Adam. What was your great grandfather's name? Adam. Subhanallah. Where the mink came from, I don't know. But anyway, it was Adam and after Adam it was Nuh. Nuh alayhi salatu wasalam. Allah says in the Quran, Waja'alna dhurriyatahu humul baqeen. It was his family that Allah gave the continuity to. The rest of them did not continue. Which means I'm related to you through Nuh alayhi salam. Guaranteed. Your forefather, Nuh. My forefather, Nuh. And guess what? It's even closer than that if only you know. I did a little DNA test. I'm talking of myself. And I was impressed to know 15 generations going back where I came from, what happened. And subhanallah, you might be wanting to know, but I can tell you it shows that we are really definitely related in many ways. So therefore, when you look at someone, look at them as though they are your blood. They are. If you were to cut me, you would see blood. If I were to cut or if you were to extract some blood from yourself, you would see blood. Subhanallah. There are only a few blood types that you have on earth. Amazing. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us from a single source. We are human beings. And that means we are part of one family. It's not fair, my brothers and sisters, to think that you are the only one who deserves to live and everyone else, they, they do not deserve to live. It's not fair. In the same way you have a brain, a mind, eyes, a nose, you, your opinion is very dear to you. In the same way other people have that right. They all have exactly the same idea. So if you were to think you are the only one and they were to think they are the only ones, you would clash. You would clash and it would not help you in any way because there would be disaster and chaos. Let's go back to the teachings from the time of Adam alayhi salam. Take from the Quran, take from revelation, the scriptures that Allah has revealed. Let's look at the version that the Quran has, which is the accurate version. Allah says, 
واتل عليهم نبا ابني ادم بالحق اذ قربا قربانا فتقبل من احدهما ولم يتقبل من الاخر a beautiful story of the children of adam first generation the children he had many children according to some narrations his wife hawa alayha salatu wassalam gave birth 20 times mashallah strong woman alhamdulillah my brothers don't compare and don't compete may allah bless you she gave birth 20 times each time she bore twins male and female each time she bore twins so she had 20 boys 20 girls the ruling at the time regarding marriage was you were allowed to marry the one who was not with you in the womb at the same time because obviously that was the beginning of man rules and regulations were different etc and remember when allah created adam alayhi salatu wassalam he took from the various parts of the earth different colors of earth and that is why the shades we have are exactly the shades of the soil across the globe subhanallah have you thought of that that's allah allah created us however Two of his sons, they started becoming jealous. One of them became jealous of another. Actually, that's more accurate. In Arabic, the names Habil and Qabil. In the English language, the names Abel and Cain. So Cain became jealous of Abel. Do you know why? There were many reasons. One of the reasons was because as mentioned in the Quran, when they gave a charity as per the instruction of the Almighty, then one was accepted and the other one was not accepted. And if you go back to the reasoning behind that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says it in the Quran, one was taken, one was not taken. How did the charity or how did it become known that it was accepted? It was through the burning of the fire. They would leave the charity on the mountain and the fire would come and burn the one that was accepted. And if it remained there, it was not taken. So because one was given with a good heart, he gave good, what we would term stock. He gave that which was pure, that which people would benefit from, etc. He gave it with a good intention. Allah accepted it. The other one, Allah alone knows, but Allah did not accept it. So one became jealous of the other. Why is yours accepted, mine not? Now look, why I started with this example. We are speaking about mending relations today. The theme is building bridges. We have to build as many bridges. Never destroy a bridge. Remember, when you destroy a bridge, how are you going to cross it? You need to build bridges as many as possible. The last time I came to Nairobi, subhanallah, I remember it took much longer to get around. But today I noticed there are new bridges, new flyovers. What happened? It took us a very short time to get here. Although I didn't realize when they said we're starting at 2.30, they were talking about Zimbabwean time. And we started for your information exactly at 2.30. We were not a minute late, but it was my time, not yours. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. I looked at it positively and I came up with that. I hope you looked at it positively too, inshallah. My brothers and sisters, the point I'm raising, when you build a bridge, you get to Jannah in a quicker way. You don't go via Jahannam. You see, you're building bridges. You are building relations. Why? It's your family. If your real brother, if your real brother was astray, wouldn't you cry for him? Wouldn't you try with him? If your real sister, one mother, one father was astray or they were deviant or they made a mistake or they were on drugs. May Allah help us all. Or they had a bad habit or for example, they might have left the deen for a moment or two. What would you do? You would be worried. You would be concerned. You would cry. You would try. You would approach. You would want to solve the problem, but you would not want anyone to attack them, harm them, destroy them and say, right, you made a mistake. I'm killing you. Astaghfirullah. That's what happened at the time of Adam alayhi salam. What did you learn? In the same way you want to, subhanallah, in the same way you want to correct your real brother or your real son or daughter, you would need to have the same passion for the rest of humanity because we are all sons and daughters of Adam and we are all brothers and sisters. But the problem is we don't ever sit and think about it.
We don't ever sit and think about it. You are seated next to someone today. That's your, your sister or your brother. Not just in faith, but in humanity to begin with. You share the same parents, subhanallah, somewhere up the ladder. Do you realize that? You could be different races, colors, tribes. That means nothing in the eyes of Allah. It is only there in order to recognize each other. Allah says, We have created you in different tribes, different people, in order that you recognize one another. You look slightly different. Why? You come from a different tribe. I look slightly different. Why? I grew up in a different part of the globe. I belong to another tribe. It is not in order for us to say my tribe is better. And this is a sickness that we face in the Ummah and on the globe at large. Every tribe thinks that it is better than the other. Every ethnicity believes that I am more superior. You want to get married? They say no. Why? Those people are bad. We all say this. Remember this. Even good people say this. They need to sit and think about it. To go back to Islam. Go back to Muhammad Sallallahu teachings. He calls it Jahiliya. He says it is bad. It is distasteful. It is ugly and unacceptable. To draw lines according to your tribes. When you are human, you belong to the tribe of Adam. Those tribes are only there to recognize each other. You are created with different facial features, not for someone to say, because you're not, you don't look like me, therefore I'm going to treat you differently. No, it is in order to recognize. Imagine if we all looked the same. It would be boring. You want to get married? Join the queue. Why? Next number. It's like buying a bottle of Coke and you just stand in the queue. Each one collects from the crate. We are insan, we are human beings, we've been honored. Allah says we have honored the children of Adam. We have given them honor. They carry themselves in such a beautiful way. Amazing. In another place of the Quran, Allah says, لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي أَحْسَنِ تَقْوِيمِ We have created mankind in the best possible posture. I love it. I love that verse because when I think about it, it's Allah challenging you and I saying we created you in the best posture. No other creature has a better posture than you. And you, if you think about it, you can never come up with a better posture than what we have given you. Have you thought of that? And I love this and I'm going to say it. Some of you might have heard me say this before. See your fingers. Can you think of any better way of positioning any of these fingers or any organ of your body? Can you think of a better place to place it? Any, any organ, think of a better place than Allah put it. Imagine if your hair was not here, what would have happened? Well, mine is not because I'm bald by the way, but Alhamdulillah, imagine if your ears were not here, they were somewhere else. Think of a place. I cannot imagine if your nose was at the back, what would happen? I wonder what would have been here then. Maybe some hair. You might have a hairstyle here in the front. Imagine your teeth, if they were not here, or your mouth was not here, it was at the back. I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to eat this way here. So Allah says, we challenge you. We made you the best, the highest. Live in that way. Why is it we are so honored by Allah, but we fight worse than cats and dogs with people who are our family. Like I said, when you have your own son, your daughter, your own brother and sister who have done wrong, wouldn't you like to reach out to them in a beautiful way? Well, the rest of us are brothers and sisters, but because the families become too big, we don't know exactly where we've been meeting, but we know at the back, we met somewhere up the ladder. It happens to us when you have big families, second cousin, third cousin, they don't even know that we're cousins. Because there are too many people and they don't want to know nowadays. But we go back, learn from the Quran. Allah says, one became jealous of the other. So what did he say? Straight up. I'm going to kill you. That's what the Quran says. Cain told Abel, I'm going to kill you. Why? What do you want to kill me for? What is killing to start with? Who taught you how to kill? Shaitan, the devil. 
the devil taught him what to do to his brother. Otherwise, before that, who knew what death was? They didn't know. It was the beginning of creation. Nobody had died yet. That was the first death. It was a murder. Have you thought of it? The first death, the first crime to be committed on earth in that regard was a murder. And the first life to be lost was through a crime. What did you learn from it? Why did Allah mention it in the Bible? Why is it mentioned in the Quran? Why do we have to read it? And we just think, oh, that's a tale. Abel and Cain. Cain killed Abel. I remember when I was learning it, when I was young, I used to mix up the brothers. Which brother was the one who had jealousy and which brother didn't? Until one day, some smart person told me, Ka, Ka, Cain, Cain killed Cain. So Ka, when you hear Qabil, you must say Qabil Qatala. He's the one who killed. And after that, I never forgot it. Like Dawood and Suleiman, when I was young, I used to mix up. Who's the father? Who's the son? They said, D is the dad. S is the son. I said, wow, beautiful. Subhanallah. You'll never forget that now, right? Dawood is the dad. Suleiman is the son. D and S, beautiful. The same applies. Qabil is the one who murdered because Qa is Qatal. Cain killed Abel. Okay. So Cain was this guy who had a Cain in his mind. Why? He hated his brother only because Allah blessed him. My brothers and sisters, what is the biggest blessing you have today? What is the biggest blessing? Isn't it your iman, your faith, your conviction, and thereafter everything else follows? In the same way you would not want people to kill you and harm you because of your choice of faith, you should not kill them and harm them because of their choice of faith. Subhanallah, we are struggling as an ummah. We are destroying ourselves as an ummah because we've become people who don't understand this. Allah kept a day of judgment to judge people. You don't need to say, because I differ with this person, khalas, I'm going to be nasty to them. Don't be nasty. Don't be nasty. We have suffered enough on the globe all over by witnessing people attacking those they differ with in one or two matters. I will differ with you. I'm a human. I like this color. You will like another. I perhaps follow this faith. You might follow another. I tell you what I have the right to follow what I want and what I believe firmly is correct. But I am wrong if I believe that the others do not have the same and equal right because I'm a human. Allah gave them the brain and the mind and they disagree with me. Simple. Build the bridge. Don't destroy it. How do you build the bridge? Reach out to the people with your difference. Reach out to them. Speak to them. Engage them if you have to. Subhanallah. I want to ask you a question. We are living in a country where we are in a minority. I'm talking of this country, my country that I come from, Zimbabwe, for example. We are in a minority. Mashallah. We believe we are correct. The Christians believe they are correct. The Jews believe that they are correct. Among the Muslims, there are sects. This one believes it is correct. The other one believes it is correct. The third one believes it is correct. What is our duty? Don't we work with one another, for one another? We drive on the same roads. Imagine a person says, I'm a Muslim. I'm not giving a right to these guys. You'll bump your car, my sister. That's not how you think. You give right to anyone, no matter who they are. Even if the car is tinted and you don't know that there's a ghost driving. It's fine. Nowadays, they have those cars. I don't know if you've heard of it. They call them self-driven vehicles. They're trying them out. By the time they get to us, they'll be working properly. For now, while they're still testing it, it will be in the first world, inshallah. We only accept perfected items. <laughs> Positive way of looking at it, my brothers and sisters, what else? They're going to tell us, you guys are 20 years behind. We say, no, no, no. We wait for you to make all the mistakes. When it's perfect, we'll take it from you. Don't worry. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all. So, Imagine if you thought that I will not fulfill their rights of the road because they belong to a different sect or faith. What will happen? You damage your car. You damage your life. You damage, you injure yourself because you are foolish. They have a right to be on the road just like you have. Same way they have a right to live just like you have. When you walk into the store or when people walk into your business, do you say, right, before you enter here, fill in the application form, what faith do you belong to? What inclination do you belong to? What sect do you belong to? How did you earn your money? They would not come to buy water from your place. Never. You would be at a loss. 
your business would run at a loss. So we are ready to entertain people of all sects and all faiths. When it comes to our business that is only going to last a few years while we are alive, we will benefit from it. Why on earth are we not prepared to tolerate them in a similar way for something far more important? And that is the deen and our faith. What is more important? Belief, deen or dunya? Your religion or the worldly life? According to us, it's your religion. If you are prepared to tolerate people for something that is common logic, that you have to tolerate them for regarding business and living and surviving, why can you not tolerate them for something much more important when the hadith says, Wallahi la an yahdi Allahu bika rajulan wahidan khayrul laka min humurin na'am. The Prophet sallallahu told Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu an that wallahi if Allah uses you to guide a single person it's better for you it's better for you than all the materialistic items of this earth so I will work I will build bridges I will continue some may be guided through me having touched them in a positive way some may not be guided but I did my duty what was my duty to market the product what was the product the deen for me to sell them, whatever my business is, say I have a supermarket. For me to sell them groceries is less important. But I do it. But for me to showcase my deen, I'm in hijab, I dress properly, I'm a Muslim, I have a name, I might have grown a beard, etc. And I'm so kind and so polite to everyone. Wallahi, they will be touched. Guidance is not in my hands. If the Prophet ﷺ was told by Allah, It is not you who guides, it's Allah who chooses whom to guide. He guides whomsoever He wishes. If that was told to Muhammad ﷺ and Allah told him, the duty of the messenger is only to convey a clear message convey it once you've conveyed it the rest is in the hands of Allah my brothers and sisters that is called da'wah that is called inviting people our duty is to invite through what your character your conduct you discuss with people yes you market your product they will try to convince you about their product so what they have the right to do it just like you have the right to do it people will come to you and say and it's, it's happened to me when i was young at school i had a friend i went to a christian college and mashallah the all the people of the majority of them were not muslim and they were a lot of them were christian most of them one of my closest buddies and you know when i once said this is a very important clarification when i once said that one of my closest friends was a christian boy Someone actually said, Sheikh, it's haram to have a Christian as a friend. How can you say that? I said, my brother, I'm allowed to marry a Christian. Do you know that? How can you say it? You've misinterpreted the verse of the Quran. The verse of Surah Al-Ma'idah does not say you're not allowed to befriend the ordinary Jews and Christians. It's talking of war. It's talking of those who have betrayed you. They've driven you out of your homes. Those who have fought you. Go and read the explanation. Tafsirul Qur'ani bil Qur'an. Suratul Mumtahina. Allah explains it. لا ينهاكم الله عن الذين لم يقاتلوكم في الدين ولم يخرجوكم من دياركم أن تبروهم وتقسطوا إليهم إن الله يحب المقسطين إنما ينهاكم الله عن الذين قاتلوكم في الدين وأخرجوكم من دياركم وظاهروا على إخراجكم أن تولوهم أن تولوهم The term awliya is being translated in Surah Al-Mumtahina Wilaya talking of someone who is going to protect you at a time of war when you are going to be striking an alliance with those who have driven you out of your homes they have proven their hatred for you then even your own father or mother will tell you son don't befriend those who have fought you common logic common sense but otherwise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about that which is kosher that which is the meat or the food of the people of the book are you allowed to eat it? I know there might be some rules and regulations, but the general verse of the Quran is that 
طعام الذين أوتوا الكتاب حل لكم وطعامكم حل لهم. The food of the people of the book is permissible for you, and your food is permissible for them. You cannot change that verse. Never. You cannot. It was one of the last verses revealed in the Quran for your information. To marry a person of the the people of the book, I'm talking of the Jews and the Christians. In Islam, there is a permissibility. Am I supposed to say, you know what, I can't befriend you, not allowed to be your friend, but I'm going to marry you. <laughs> I'm going to marry you. You can love your spouse, even though she may not be a Muslim, technically. I know you must be saying, what did he just say? Go and read the Quran. Don't argue with me. That's Allah. Yes, there are rules governing it. I'm not saying there are no rules, but technically we know it's permissible. It is a verse of the Quran. You cannot deny. No one can deny it. Like I said, it's one of the last verses revealed towards the end of the life of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So this young man tells me that, you know what? I want you to become a Christian. And he explained to me a lot of his detail. I told him, well, I want you to become a Muslim. I believe in Jesus anyway, but it's you who doesn't believe in Muhammad. Peace be upon him. And we used to talk about it every day, but we lost no connection in terms of friendship. We were still friends up to today. He became a religious leader in Christianity and you know where I am sitting. Subhanallah. And up to today, I, if I see him interact with him, communicate with him, we talk about faith. But he's my brother in humanity because he is also from Adam. The problem is we become so passionate that we start hating people rather than discussing the difference. I hate this guy. Why? Because I differ with him. He belongs to another sect, you know. Relax. If that was the case, we would hate everybody. If your own brother belonged to that sect, what would happen to you? You would say, you know what? He's my brother. I differ with him. I'll keep on engaging him. I'll talk with him, but I love him. He's my brother. Well, we are all brothers and sisters. Do you not see the logic? Don't let someone confuse you by telling you you're not brothers and sisters. How could you say that? I heard one of the great sheikhs saying, you know, our brothers, the Christians and people fired at him saying, how could you call them brothers? He says, are they not our brothers in humanity? We were all astray at some stage. We were all astray and in the same way we feel we are right. They feel they are right. If you are going to start your own way of doing things and developing hatred, you're going to end up like Cain and Abel. Start hating on people because something happened to them that didn't happen to you. So what happened there? He killed his brother. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about it. Allah says, فَأَصْبَحَ مِنَ النَّادِمِينَ مِنْ أَجْلِ ذَلِكِ Because he killed his brother, he became from among those who were filled with regret. Filled with regret. He regretted it. Too late. He's dead. A lot of the people who harm others, who have perpetrated injustices against others, they regret it. Sometimes it's too late. Sometimes it's too late. I can give you a quick one. Many people just go through a quick divorce, small difference of opinion in the marriage. You know, you like this drink and I like that drink, right? Get out, go back home. It's as it's become as petty as that nowadays, petty. They divorce and after a while they regret, you know what? I shouldn't have done this. Guess what? It might just be too late. It might be too late. That might be a light example. A heavier example is when you harm people, when you attack them, when you kill them, when you promote harming others, take it easy. You want to hate the deed, you may hate the deed, but the individual you keep discussing, keep trying, that's your brother or your sister in humanity. You share a relationship with them just like you would when it was your own. How would you like it if others looked at your son or daughter or brother or sister or parent who might be astray and they decided to harm them and attack them and you say, no, please don't, please don't. It's my brother. I'll try to talk to him. Allah says, even to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, like I recited the verse, I'll read another one. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, In alayka illa al -balag. Your duty, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is none other than to convey the message. Whether they accept it or not, is in the eyes of Allah. Remember this. 
What's your duty? My duty is to continue spreading good, to continue reminding people. They might remind me of something else. I will remind them of what I know, the goodness, the kindness. I would love that they were to accept Islam. They may not, and they might. They might love for me to do something else. I won't if I don't want, but I respect them. They are humans. They believe in their hearts something with a similar passion of my own belief. How can I say that you are supposed to attack anyone who's different from you when that is the case? Talk to them, address them and understand my brothers and sisters somewhere up the ladder. We were not Muslims. Our forefathers or whoever else belong to another religion altogether. Someone was kind enough to come either through good business dealings, either through expressing, discussing, relating, communicating in some good way. They came and guess what? We accepted the deen. Why have we become impatient today? Why? It is this impatience that made us speak about building bridges. And this is why we say you mend the relationship. Look at Abel and Cain. Had they mended the relationship, it wouldn't have happened. He would not have killed his brother. And there was a discussion between the two of them mentioned in the Quran, which goes to show that Abel or Habil had tried with his brother to convince him not to harm him. He says, oh, my brother. La he told his brother oh my brother if you are going to extend your hand to harm me i want you to I am not going to extend my hand to harm you because I fear Allah who is the Lord of the worlds. What do I learn from it? Why did Allah put that verse in the Quran? Someone wants to harm you. Fear Allah who is the Lord of the worlds. Why do you want to harm them in return? Why? Learn from this verse. The brother is telling his own brother to say, I'm not going to harm you. The reason is I fear Allah. This proves that those who harm others in the name of Islam, they, they don't fear Allah. You follow what I'm saying? They don't fear Allah. They create chaos. They create confusion. And they don't like people who promote anything besides that confusion. I read you verses of the Quran regarding the first crime and I'm showing you the discussion that happened. The brother says, I'm not going to harm you because even if you harm me, I fear Allah. Please don't. Let's engage in discussion. Talk to me. Let's understand each other. We are brothers. The brother still killed him. When he killed him, Allah says, he became from among those who regretted. I read that verse. After that, Allah says, من أجل ذلك كتبنا على بني إسرائيل أنه من قتل نفس من قتل نفسا بغير نفس أو فساد في الأرض فكأنما قتل الناس جميعا. What a powerful verse. Allah says for that reason. We wrote to the children of Israel. We wrote to those whom we sent the scriptures to that if you were to kill a single person or you were to spread chaos and corruption on earth, it is equivalent in sin to having destroyed humanity at large. That's a verse of the Quran. If you are corrupt chaos, you like to spread chaos and you kill people, even if you've killed one, you are equivalent to the one who has destroyed humanity because you started a trend that will not end in a rush. Look at the chaos we have across the globe. We are watching country by country, city by city, people by people in disaster. Don't you see it happening? You read the papers, you watch the news every day. You see people killing each other, burning each other, fighting each other, bombing each other. What did you and I learn from that? We are watching them burning their houses. We saw why 
they got to where they got to but we did not learn a lesson sit down relax don't allow your house to be burnt in the same way because tomorrow we don't want to be a statistic where other people are watching the news about us doing the same thing and we did not learn a lesson that's why we're talking about building bridges that's why we're talking about mending relations mend it don't let your ego overtake you mend the relation try and keep trying don't give up learn from the destruction of others what destroyed them and understand that if you don't learn from their lesson and you don't stop yourselves from what they did you will end up in a similar way and no one wants to end up that way look at the destruction none of us want to be destroyed so why is it that we keep on doing the same thing that they were doing before they were destroyed they started hurting each other, killing each other, intolerant of each other, based on what? Differences that I have. I remember once we were talking to someone and he happened to belong to a different sect of Islam. And the brother with me was telling me, Sheikh, how could you speak to this guy? You know, I said, what's wrong? I said, you know, if I sat with you now, we would also have our differences, even within one, own, one sect. It's human. We would be able to. My duty is to discuss. I am not saying don't believe that what you have is wrong or right. I am saying believe that you are right. Believe that you are right. Don't believe that what you have is wrong. Believe you are right. But understand the others have the same right to believe that what they are within is right. And you have the human right, both of you, to discuss it with one another, to talk about it if you want to, to keep on engaging each other if you have to but you can never shove anything down the other's throat this is why allah says la ikraha there is no compulsion when it comes to entering the fold of islam how many people have declared shahada i've seen in my own life countless people whenever i have people who want to accept the shahada i like to ask them a question are you being forced is anyone compelling you? Are you sure your own free will? You, you are doing it for yourself because you believe? Yes, 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 yes. Then you can repeat the shahada after me. But if someone is forcing you, I'm sorry. In Islam, we don't force people to enter into the fold of Islam. You need to thank Allah. We are living in countries whereby, mashallah, look, you are dressed with the hijab. Thank Allah. You have facilities to fulfill your salah, the masajid, etc. Thank Allah. Appreciate these favors because it has already been taken away from others. Wallahi, it has been taken away from others. Appreciate it. Learn to contribute to building the nation. Learn. Stop deceiving yourself into believing that I need to harm and attack and believe ill about anyone who differs with me because that is the way the others were destroyed and they are still being destroyed. Where are we? Where are they? Let's look at another few examples. Mending relations. Look at Yusuf alayhi salam. Beautiful story. I'm sure we all should be knowing the story of the Prophet Joseph. May peace be upon him. The Quranic version, amazing. It is the accurate version. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about the same quality of jealousy. Who was jealous of whom? A whole group of brothers were jealous of one. They planned his downfall. I want to fast forward the story towards the end. It was very easy for Yusuf, Joseph, may peace be upon him, while he was sitting in the position of authority. The day that his brothers came, it was very easy to tell his comrades and his chiefs, please jail them. They have wasted 40 years of my life. According to one of the narrations, the gap was 40 years. How many years? Four zero. But he didn't do that. Why is his story mentioned in the Quran? <laughs> we are relating to you the best of stories. The whole surah, surah Yusuf, we hear it, we read it, we recite it, we enjoy it, we know its meaning, etc. What lesson did you learn from it? Zero. Zero. No lesson. 
The man after 40 years, he was in authority. He could have jailed his brothers, fixed them up, punished them like what some of us do with our own brothers and sisters. We become a bit wealthy. We become a bit in authority and we want to fix our own brothers and sisters because he, he chose to marry someone from another tribe. I don't ever want you to step foot in my house. What's wrong with you? What did you learn from revelation? Are you a godly person? Those who are godly, they promote harmony and peace and goodness and solution. They build bridges. They don't destroy. A sign of closeness to Allah is you are softened. Allah says to Muhammad وسلم, it is because of the mercy of Allah. It is because of the mercy of Allah that you are lenient with them. It shows you that leniency is a sign of the mercy of Allah. When you are lenient with your family members, those who work for you, those who live with you, those whom you interact with, those of other faiths, etc. When you are lenient and kind with them, that is a sign of the mercy of Allah upon you. So don't be mistaken. Yusuf alayhi salam, what did he do? The best act, the best act possible. He was building bridges and mending relations. Mending relations with those who had planned to kill him, to harm him, to destroy him, to exterminate him. Allah gave him authority. It goes to show no matter how much people plan to harm you or try to harm you, they will not be able to reach you with harm. In fact, their plan might be the same plan that will propel you into success or a successful position. Like the story of Yusuf alayhi salam. So Allah says very clearly that Yusuf alayhi salam asked them a question. Do you know what you did to Yusuf and his brother while you were ignorant? They looked at him and they thought to themselves, no one knows what we did to Yusuf. No one knows what we did to Yusuf besides him and his brother. So this must be Yusuf. They asked him, Yusuf. Is it possible? Are you Yusuf? Are you Yusuf? He says, and listen to the answer. Ana Yusuf wa Allahu Akbar. Yes, I'm Yusuf. This is my brother. Allah has favored us. Allah has favored us. That was his first statement. Why? I don't want to think about negatives. He didn't say, I am Yusuf, this is my brother, and now I'm going to fix you guys. That's what we would have said. Yes, I'm going to fix you. You see, you will be jailed for 40 years. We're going to destroy you. Look at this, look at that. No, I am Yusuf, this is my brother. Allah has favored us. Had it not been for your plan, I would not have been sitting here today. I would have still been playing with you guys somewhere far away. So it was Allah's plan. You thought you were doing something negative, but positivity and only positivity came out of the whole thing. Amazing. Look at how he mends this relation. He says, he says, no retribution against you today. I'm not going to take any revenge. Zero. Allah will forgive you. Go and get dad and mom and bring them here. Let's have a party. Subhanallah. Reunion. Reunion with a party with mom and dad and everyone else after 40 years of separation. If you are not prepared to forgive, you will never be able to mend relations. Mark those words. If you are not prepared to forgive, you don't need to forget. Forgive and forget is not an Islamic concept. But forgive and forgive is an Islamic concept. You will have to remember it at the back of your mind. You know what? These brothers, this is what they did to me. I forgave them and I love them. You don't need to forget it completely. Bear it. It's a lesson. If Allah wanted it to be forgotten totally, he would not have mentioned it in the Quran. Because why would he want us to talk about it for so many, up to eternity actually. But Allah says, no, learn a lesson from what happened in your past. Learn it. Maybe you want to speak about it in order to derive a positive message or lesson, not in order to be negative. So he says, I forgive you. And you know what? Go and call mom and dad. When mom and dad came, they all gathered around and mashallah, they spoke about the past and Yusuf alayhi salam kept blaming shaitan. 
in the verse he says wajaa bikum min al-badu min ba'di an nazagha ash-shaytan bayni wa bayna ikhwati allah has brought all of you from the desert and brought you here as bedouins from the desert after shaytan had separated us as brothers we will not allow shaytan to do that so what's the lesson look at how allah loved this man so much allah mentioned his story in the quran allah spoke about how he forgave allah spoke about the beauty allah spoke about his achievements allah spoke about so much because he forgave after so many years of hostility if you're not prepared to forgive and forgo you will not be able to build bridges you will destroy bridges you have to have a big heart today all of us seated here all of us who are going to be watching this or listening to it later on my brothers and sisters the message i have for you take a lesson from this build your bridges with your brothers and sisters whom you may have destroyed them with build them mend your relations and allah will speak about you just like he spoke about yusuf alayhi salam in this case it has stopped but allah will mention you with the angels as he has promised it's a big thing it requires great courage and strength to forgive the one who forgives is the more powerful person it is a sign of strength we all have issues and problems and matters that's why we are here to remind us to say don't let those matters and issues make you forget the fact that you are actually brothers and sisters he who forgives shall be forgiven by allah irhamu man fil ardi yarhamkum man fis sama have mercy upon those on earth and the one in the heavens will have mercy upon you i want to end with one more example you know at the time of muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam the kuffar of quraish the people of quraish who did not accept the message they harmed the muslims they attacked them they even murdered some of them they drove them out of their homes they usurped their wealth they perpetrated heinous crimes against the muslims they prepared armies to attack the muslims the battle of badr took place the battle of uhud took place the battle of the trench took place the treaty of hudaybiyah took place the treaty of hudaybiyah is a topic on its own where we learn how to build bridges subhanallah and we learn the benefit of building bridges but i don't have the time to go through the treaty of hudaybiyah i want you to go through it yourself in the books of sirah the books of history what was the benefit of building those bridges with your enemies there was a lot of benefit a lot of benefit however i want to take you right through to the victory of makka where the mu'minin marched into makka more than a hundred thousand subhanallah and they were beautifully and orderly arriving within Makkah al Mukarramah in large numbers, huge armies. And the people of Makkah knew that there is no way that we are going to survive today. No way. There is only one way. This man, if he has mercy on us, that's the only way out. If there is anything else, we are gone. He has the right to do what he wants with us because we have done so much to them. They wouldn't be wrong if they attacked and harmed and actually destroyed everyone. But again, position of strength, authority. The Prophet ﷺ gathered them. He told them, Ya ma'ashara Quraysh, O people of Quraysh. It's similar to the question of Yusuf ﷺ to the brothers when he says, do you know what you did to Yusuf? Here the Prophet ﷺ says, Mada tadunnuna anni fa'ilum bikum. O people of Quraysh, what do you think I'm going to do to you today? Wow. They could have said anything and he could have done anything because they had wronged him. And the Muslimin for a long, long time, what do you think I'm going to do to you today? They had no response besides the murmur of some of them where they said, you are an honorable man. You know what he says? I will tell you 
what the prophet Joseph, may peace be upon him, told his brothers. Go, all of you, you are, there will be no revenge or retribution against you today. They were shocked. This is the true quality of a Muslim. This is the quality of the messengers of Allah. Because it is really, it requires power to forgive someone. You are the most powerful person. You have liberated yourself and all others when you forgive. You liberate yourself. For as long as you held it, there was a burden. There was hatred. There was plotting. There was planning. There was harm. There was loss of wealth. There was loss of life. There was so much of damage. No. Learn. These people had not accepted Islam. They were no ordinary disbelievers. They were the kuffar of Quraysh. They were the ones who harmed and killed the Muslims. And here is the prophet. He did not say, whoever accepts Islam, you are safe. If you don't, we are coming for you. He didn't say that. He made a blanket rule, blanket. He says, you are free today. There is no retribution. What did he do? He mended relations that were destroyed for years. These are my family members. This is my tribe. These are my people. This is my city. How can I harm them and kill them and destroy them? How will the city flourish and grow if there is going to be fighting and killing in it? Brothers and sisters, look across the globe. Check the fighting and killing. Are those cities prospering? Are they prospering in any way? Do people even pray in peace? No. Be careful. Don't allow those examples to fly by without a lesson for you and I. The lesson is I'm not going to repeat what history has taught me, if I were to do, I would only end up in a worse way. Never. Build the bridge. Ensure that you make the difference. Here is the Prophet, peace be upon him. As a result of forgiving the people of Quraysh wholesale, most of them accepted Islam because they were shocked. They were in awe. They were shocked. Imagine someone's harming you. Harm With us, it's just our relatives. It's only our relatives who do that. People who interact with us. Normally people complain about my father, my mother, my son, my daughter, my mother-in-law, my father-in-law, etc. Those are the complaints. We're not ready to forgive Allah. The Prophet ﷺ forgave the kuffar of Quraysh. Your mother-in-law is nowhere near that. May Allah forgive all of us. Your daughter-in-law. She's okay, don't worry. Never mind, no retribution. Give them their way. They will come closer to you. They will come so close because you did the right thing. My brothers and sisters, this example is correct. Not just for your relationships within your families, not just within your communities, not just amongst the Muslims with different sects, but amongst those who don't share with you your faith as well. Because here it is. The Prophet ﷺ gave you the highest of examples. Today, I spent one hour speaking to you. And I've given you example upon example from revelation to prove to you that this faith and this religion is all about building bridges and it's all about mending relations, mending relations. And that is why the Prophet says, A person fulfilling his relations is not one who has a tit for tat relationship. They do something, you do something. They give you a gift, you give them a gift. They invite you to the wedding, you invite them to the wedding. That's not a powerful relationship. The hadith says, the true maintainer of good relations is the one who strives to mend the broken relationship. Ask yourself, do I strive to mend the broken relations in my home, in my life? If the answer is no, today you have learned something. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us put into practice what we have learned. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you all. May Allah bless all those who have made this a reality. And indeed, as the MC had said at the beginning, no fidgeting, no doing this. I think I was the one fidgeting and I was the one doing the most. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease. You've been such a blessed audience. May Allah bless you all. May Allah grant you goodness for your patience, inshallah. And insha we will be having 
another short session and I pray that you can bear patience with us for that as well. Aqulu qawli hadha wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad wa sallamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Takbir, Takbir, wonderful. Sheikh, we have nothing to reward you with except pray for you. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give you tawfiq in your work. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give you a long life so that you can continue benefiting the ummah. Sitting here listening to the Sheikh, I was asking myself, and I want to believe that each one of us was asking themselves, have I burnt bridges with my brother? It's all about building bridges with yourself, with your family, with your wife, with your husband, with your neighbors, with fellow Muslims, no matter what their sects are, with even other human beings who do not belong to you. Powerful. Jazakallah khairan, Sheikh. And talking about Sheikh mentoring the Ummah, I was just given statistics here of those Muslims who have registered for this lecture. First of all, do you think there are more sisters or brothers that have attended, have registered? Sisters, just listen. Waswahili wanasema msiandike kwa mate na wino upo. 8,000 people have registered for this uh, function. The sisters are 52%. So definitely the brothers are 48%. When it comes to age, do you think the old ones are more than the youth? The youth are more. Listen to this. Between age 12 and 20, 24 percent. 21 to 30, 57 percent. Try to see where you fit. For me, I'm not yet there. Badu, Badu, Mimi and Farouk Adam, not yet. Eh? 31 to 50, 15 percent. 66 and above, 1 percent. Meaning, Sheikh is talking mostly to the youth. And talking about the youth, there is a message from me in the presence of the sheikh and before the second session as we arrange the bench if the bench can be arranged the way we want us to sit young people we always look for celebrities you call them celebs true or not true when it comes to football ronaldo huh? and all those funny names those are your celebrities and sometimes you have celebrities that are not sharia compliant at an age when we are talking about Sharia compliant finance, Sharia compliant food, can we call our Sheikh Sharia compliant celebrity? Is he or not? The message to the youth is this. You don't have to do haram to be a celebrity. Sharia compliant celebrity. Do you agree with me or not? Takbir. Now, we're going to the second session. But I hope you saw the CS whispering to me because we began late, late. So we were not going to move for the 45 minutes question and answer. And I was listening to the sheikh and taking notes. Well, some of the questions that I had prepared for him, he has already answered. So I will not ask him the questions that he has already answered. And because you were told this session has to be comfortable, it is a sofa set uh, uh, talk. I think I'll give this mic to the sheikh. Now, Sheikh Mufti Wenk, most of the questions you keep on asking is about your name. We understand Ismail, we understand Musa, but Menk, where is it from? China or some other place? Very quickly. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. My brothers and sisters, I spoke about it in my talk. What were you doing, Sheikh? Were you listening or you were dozing? I, I, I was listening. <laughs> Subhanallah. Okay, I think uh, it's a surname, and surnames sometimes they. I was in, interested myself to find out where it's from and what has happened and so on. So we found similar names in many parts of the globe, but if you ask me, I really would not be able to tell you so much of detail because I don't have it myself. Okay. But I do know that here in the crowd, there are approximately seven and a half thousand minks. 
Because we're all from Adam. And Adam was a mink, by the way. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, <laughs> no, what I mean is, inshallah, he was a human being and so are we. Okay. So, alhamdulillah, actually, I, I don't know. I, I don't know. Uh, perhaps somewhere up my great, great, great grandfather's and it came down. Uh, we do have uh, roots within the Indian subcontinent as well as Yemen. Okay. So, uh, these roots are mixed and lately we have African blood in us as well. So it's amazing how Allah brings us all together. And like I was saying, um, we're all related somehow, inshallah. Jazakallah khairan. Now, uh, second question. Uh, are you a Zimbabwean by accident or by Allah's plan? Do you, do you, by default or what? Very quickly. Okay, that's a very interesting question. My great-grandfather was in South Africa. Okay. And uh, he then left from there for Hajj and he passed away in Mina in 1904 I think and my father there are just two brothers this was my great-grandfather and then uh, he had uh, two sons and thereafter my father was born from his grandfather who's Ibrahim and uh, he he shifted to Zimbabwe in order to teach the Dean so he's actually a very active scholar a lot of the oldest generation from Nairobi from Kenya would know him because he used to visit here in the 80s and he knows quite a few in fact when I was leaving he told me you will meet Sheikh Abdul Ghafoor and a few others please give them Sheikh Rao and some others give them my kind regards and salam so it just to show you that I was born and raised in Africa so Alhamdulillah I've been there by the plan of Allah Jazakallah khairan. Why I ask that? Because some people think that they belong to a country by accident. I believe we belong to Kenya by Allah's plan. Do you agree with me? If you think it is by accident, just pack and go. I don't know where you're going. Yeah. Sheikh, about your educational background, your educational background, because traditionally we are used to people who follow uh, religious uh, trainings, mostly they don't speaking mostly they don't use english when they are talking we followed your lectures mostly in english and we know you're also you, you're also educated deeply in islam just for the youth to know what is your education background i am still a student actually we learn every day more and more about the dean and i love those who correct me and those who uh, can tell me where I'm going wrong, even if it is in the English language. And I do have people, mashallah, may Allah bless them. They go through my talks, they listen to what I have to say, they correct my language, my choice of words, they correct the way I say things and my pronunciation. Uh, they know who they are, may Allah bless them all, and <laughs> may Allah grant them Jannatul Firdaus. Okay. Uh, the reason I start off this way is because uh, I think none of us should think that we have knowledge that is complete we will never have complete knowledge we continue to learn continue to correct ourselves until the day we die uh, i did start very early with my secular education at the government schools in zimbabwe initially the primary school was at a government uh, school and i was doing hif with that i completed my hif with the completion of my primary school my father being the sheikh i used to be with him uh, he has taught all my brothers and sisters the Arabic language and uh, the Quran and Tafsir and so many other things. I learned Urdu uh, with my father as well who taught us. He speaks Persian, he speaks Urdu and he's learned all these languages. So uh, we learned a little bit from what he has. Uh, then I wanted to, I, I joined a Christian college which was one of the best colleges in Zimbabwe uh, for secular education, being a top student, alhamdulillah. And uh, I wanted to always become an ophthalmologist. So sp specialize in medicine. And right at the end, I had already studied as much as I could about Islam. I studied the books of Hadith and so on by the age of, before the age of 18. And so I was ready to become a doctor. And suddenly there was an application that someone had put without my knowledge for Medina Munawwara. And the, the uh, acceptance note had come to me while I was still waiting for my acceptance from uh, a certain academy in Texas, in the States. And in the meantime, my father told me, you know what? Um, you have just been accepted in Medina, so why don't you go? You cannot refuse Medina Munawara. 
And so because I had this Islamic background, I was already a Hafiz of the Quran. I could already speak uh, Arabic quite a bit, although it needed polishing if it were to become the medium of instruction. So I joined the Jamia al Islamiyah. Uh, the idea was to see how I fitted in. If I did, Alhamdulillah, if I didn't, I would come back and continue with my medicine. And so the deal was when I finish, I would come back and still do my medicine. If I did finish. But when I went, it was very tough the first year because Medina Munawwara and the university there is quite difficult to actually survive in because of the weather, because of the heat, because of so many differences uh, in the, the way maybe the dormitories are set out and so on. Those who've been there, they know the challenges. And we are used to, you know, having our food ready and everything okay. And your mummy looks after you and now suddenly you're swimming in an ocean without mummy. Uh, having given you the float to float by. So Alhamdulillah, there was a time when one of the lecturers was lecturing and that I was, I'm sorry to confess to you that I used to cry sometimes missing home, you know. I used to cry sometimes missing home, only at the initial uh, stages. And uh, I remember I wanted to go in my heart, I used to say, I think I need to leave. And one day one of the lecturers was talking about Medina and the hadith from Al-Bukhari, which says in al madina tayyibatun tanfil khabath kama yanfil kiru khabath al hadid madina is pure it chases away and kicks out impurities the same way the blacksmith blows into the ore to kick out the impurities that hadith stuck in my mind and it went into my heart and i always told myself i'm not leaving i'm not impurity i'm not impurity if i leave maybe madina kicked me out so i don't want to go and so therefore I didn't go. And within the next few months, I started loving the place so much that there came a stage when I had to leave because I had graduated and I did not want to leave. So that's Medina and that's my journey. After that, I went to India. Obviously, I specialized in the Hanafi school of thought in order to learn and understand and to be able to uh, uh, learn and polish up the languages that I had learned already, Urdu and so on, and to be able to work within our communities and societies uh, where we have a large ethnic Indo-Pak community. And Alhamdulillah, I don't regret those days. I really grew so much. Um, after that, I continued learning. I've participated in several symposiums, workshops, etc. Uh, there came a day when uh, there is a university based in the Philippines called the Aldersgate University. It's a Christian college, actually. And they decided to award me with an honorary doctorate in social guidance. A doctorate of social guidance so basically that happened in 2016 in april and uh, yeah subhanallah I, I was just amazed and i continue teaching and learning as best as i can uh, jazakallah khair wonderful one thing that your father was able to beat me in i'm not able to educate my own children at home very serious eh? how was he able to educate i think uh, a question for another day you are the grand mufti of zimbabwe currently Yes. Is that a position that, are you, are you an employee of the government or how do you become a mufti in Zimbabwe? That's a very interesting question because I've traveled to many countries and there are two, three different types of muftis. One is, if it is a predominantly Muslim country or a Muslim country, you will find the mufti is generally a part of the government yeah. or he, belonging to an arm of the government. But if it is a country where we are in a minority, a lot of the times you will have a national body that appoints a mufti. So if that national body happens to work throughout the country, they have, you know, the, the, the strong relations with the government, etc. The mufti falls under the national body. So that is the case with us. Majlis al-Ulama of Zimbabwe is a national body that serves the interests of the Muslims of the country. Uh, over, the, over many years, they've built approximately 50, beyond 50 masajid and schools, etc. Uh, they've done a lot of activity, still continuing with a lot of the Islamic institutions, empowered thousands of uh, the locals uh, in uh, not only Islamic studies, but secular education as well, which is extremely important. And I happen to be elected as the Mufti since the year 2000. So it's been 17, 18 years. MashaAllah. Every second year, we have elections. Alhamdulillah. Jazakallah khairan. Now, there's a lot in common between Zimbabwe and Kenya in that we have a Muslim community living within a majority non-Muslim community. How is the relationship between Muslims and non-Muslims in Zimbabwe? 
Mashallah, we have a very, very good relationship with the non-Muslims. And like I said today, and I really mean every word that I uttered, we have to build relations. We do not break them. We build bridges, be they Christians or Jews or people who belong to the traditional faith or anyone else it is. Trust me, we are citizens of the same nation. If we were to uh, not to fulfill their rights, we would not be able to survive ourselves. We are in a minority. We've been afforded the beauty of fulfillment of our faith in such a lovely way that sometimes even some of the Muslim countries do not give, some of the Muslim countries do not give their citizens similar rights. We need to know this. It's a reality. I'm sure if you study the world, you'll come across some of these nations, yeah. some, but they're there. So we have to appreciate it and we have to continue understanding, engaging, dialogue. We serve on interfaith boards as well, whereby we give and take, we understand and you know, we respect each other's differences and we know that we will not trample on the toes of the others. We don't force and we shall not be forced. But at the same time, we respect and we live together. We contribute to the nation together. And Alhamdulillah, that's the way I would like to see not only our nation, but all the nations, including yours, develop and grow by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't shy away from your Muslim identity because when you contribute to your nation with your Muslim identity, they acknowledge that yes, there are Muslims who are contributing to the nation. And that's how you will achieve respect even amongst those who may have looked at Islam as a faith that perhaps the world is portraying to be barbaric, intolerant, extreme. No, we're not. We live in your midst. We are in the thousands, sometimes in the hundreds of the thousands and perhaps even in the millions in nations where we serve. There may be from amongst us a small group of people who might have a warped understanding. We will continue to engage them too to be able to come to the mainstream understanding that is definitely for the benefit of every one of us. May Allah bless us all. Jazakallah khairan. Maintain your identity and engage. Remember in Kenya, the constitution gives us the freedom of worship. We have the Qadis courts. We have the Education Act recognizing the Muslim Education Council headed by our brother Munawar Khan sitting here. So we engage without losing your hijab, without losing your identity as a Muslim. That is the message. Mufti Menk, maybe among the last few questions, and I feel it's becoming hot now. I feel like removing my jacket. Uh, if, you re if you notice, I actually told them to turn the fan on before you came in, okay. because I knew it's you hot. would feel the heat. Yeah, because I would say, and what a guest. If you want to know something else, when he initially started it, it was facing me. And I told him, rotate it, please, to face everyone, because the heat is about to be felt. What a guest. What a topic, I would say that. Eh? Now, now, about madrasa teaching, eh? I have a question. Yes. This is personal because of my experience. When my parents became Muslims, I was taken to, a, actually, a duksi. Duksi is a Quran school. And the biggest, one of the, 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 the most important teaching aids or tools of teaching is a big stick. Big stick, what do you think about the kind of corporal punishment that goes on in madrasas? In education now, it is banned. But in our madras, I can see the minister smiling <laughs> because he knows exactly what I'm talking about. Okay. The first, cane and yes, the madrasa. The cane. The I spoke about Abel and Cain. So Cain was the killer. So don't use the cane, okay, inshallah. Okay. Uh, I can tell you something very interesting. Firstly, you use the word duxi. Is it duxi? Yeah, duxi. Duxi is a friend of mine back at home. His name is Duxi. So when you said we were taken to Duxi, I thought you, that man is younger than you, subhanallah. But anyway, I learned something and I, I'm sure he will listen to what I have to say and he will be very interested to hear it. But let's get back to what you are saying. My brothers and sisters on a serious note, who was the best teacher ever? Was it not Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam? How many Sahaba did he build and educate? Were they not the greatest? How many did he beat up in order to teach them? Even one? No. So when we beat up the kids, we're actually displaying our own inability. That's what I believe. Because the messenger you claim to follow Never beat up. Look, there's a child in front of me smiling so broad. I hope you are not beaten by your... Or... What's it called? The duxi. Subhanallah. 
You know, it's a fact. When I see the people actually beating up kids, I think to myself, your Nabi did not beat them to teach them the deen. No, he didn't. How many became Hafiz? Many of them. They were the champions of Hadith. They were the ulama of ulama. They were not beaten. They loved it. They enjoyed the environment, the company. They wanted to be there. Today we're talking about deen. We're talking about faith, religion, building bridges, etc. Who forced you to come here? No one. Subhanallah, you registered to come on your own. May Allah bless you. I think the reason is you knew when we go there, we are going to be inspired. We are going to feel like good Muslims. We are going to get something we need. We are going to actually be listening to something that will empower us. That's why you came. So if our duxies can employ the same methods to empower, to inspire, to give people hope, to make them feel that identity and not to just judge them and tell them you are going to hell and you are going to burn in Jahannam and the fire of Jahannam is right behind the wall. That if you don't keep up, you chase people away from the deen, including your own children. They don't want to learn the Quran because for them, it's a burden. I'm going to go there. What's going to happen? Let's teach them in a beautiful way. You might say, what is that way? Well, that is a topic on its own. I've spoken about it in the past in some of my lectures. Maybe one day in the future, we might have a workshop to address the muallimin and muallimat, inshallah, and address this matter. But my brothers and sisters, when teaching the deen, even in your own home, you're encouraging your children for salah. Don't say, come and read Salatul Fajr or I'm going to beat you. No, that's not the way. You rather say, come with me, let's read. In fact, I want to teach you something that came to my mind now. When you fulfill your salah and when you do something good, have a good expression on your face. Very good. When you fulfill salah, get up without looking lazy and show that you are so enthusiastically interested in it. When your kids watch you, they're going to say, look at mom. She gets up so happy in the morning and look at dad. He's excited and he goes for salah. He comes back in a good mood and he's there like the world has actually been thrown at his feet. They will come for salah on their own. The problem with us, get up for salah last minute. We are rushing half closed eyes. Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar, Allah Sami Allah, 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 Allah. Ah, Back into bed. The child says, oh, this is something you're not supposed to be doing. So it's a method of teaching. Show a good expression. When you wear your hijab, for example, smile. MashaAllah, it looks lovely. You know, your kids must see you in a good mood. Not I wore my hijab. And that's it. No smiling. The kids are going to subconsciously think that mom, every time she wears the hijab, she's in a bad mood. You know, no. That's how you educate your kids. Choose the method. Be enthusiastic. Be happy when you sit with the Quran. Sit happily. Read aloud. Smile. Look very excited before and after your act of worship. See, they will come. Anyway, that's something that just came to my mind. So what the point of the whole uh, issue that I'm trying to raise is that, you know, the methods of encouraging and teaching change with the changing of times. But the message itself does not change. So the deen will not change. But today, you might want to use technology as bait in order to get your child to do things. You have brownie points they can get. You have stars they can accumulate. You get 10 stars, I give you one hour on your iPad. Mashallah, they will get 10 stars. You can use it as a bargaining tool. We have a naughty corner. You put someone in the naughty corner. Someone, after 50 years, they might come with research to prove that a naughty corner is actually emotional abuse. They might say that because you're abusing the child. So, when they come with that research, we might have to change the method. We'll make a good corner to say everyone else remains here and all the good people go there. It could happen, but we keep up with the times inshallah. Not that the message changes, but the methods change. Everything else is being marketed in the most powerful, beautiful, attractive way. Why can we not use similar marketing for the deen, for religion? I think we can inshallah. Jazakallah khair. That is wonderful. Let us not make our children on Saturday because it's the day to go to Madrasa. They pray, Ya Allah, anzil alayna marad. May Allah send down disease so that we don't go to Madrasa. This is what is happening. At least I used to pray that on Friday night I fall sick not to go to Madrasa because of the terrorism 
terrorism in the madrasas. But I'm sure the stakeholders have heard that. Munawar Khan and your team in Muslim Education Council, uh, please, we need to do something. There is a picture going on in the social media. Recently, if I can add, yeah. recently I saw maybe a picture. I, I'm talking of a video. Yes. There was a video of a madam at a school who, as the that, kids are entering, she's hugging them yes. and turning them around, and each one goes in so happy. Yes, and exactly. then they're showing uh, Mallam, the sheikh, he's beating one by one, hew, 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 as they're going in, you know. Have you seen it? Well, I think you, I, I, I sent it to quite a few of the Mallams, you know, quite a few of the Muallimin and the teachers. And they were telling me, we are going to make a video showing a better acrobatics than the other teacher. We will show you. Yeah. I said, I'm waiting. I'm waiting. Subhanallah. May Allah bless us all. I think uh, that video, it was a little bit far-fetched, but it does touch some form of reality. Uh, to a certain extent, it yeah. definitely hits home. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it a means of us learning lesson. And uh, really, your kids, your children, those who are learning from you, they are your friends. Yes, they will be the line of respect because you are a parent or a teacher. Yes. But at the end of the day, they are your friends, inshallah. Uh, I hope that we can make more WhatsApp videos yes. that can show the other side of the coin, yes, inshallah. Allah. And I think we shall stop comparing uh, the Ma'alim with Jibreel because they say the only way the Prophet ﷺ could learn Iqra is by being squeezed. So the child has to be squeezed. And my answer is that my child... But hang on, hang on, hang on. That lady in that video, was she not squeezing those kids? That man who was whipping them was nowhere squeezing them. The, the cane was squeezing them. Be careful, Sheikh. Jazakallah khair. Lastly, but not the least, Sheikh, your final word to Kenyans. You've just come from a very heated political season. We have a lot of things going on in the country. We need healing. What is the final message to your Muslim brothers and sisters in this beautiful country, the pride of Africa? My brothers and sisters, before I answer the question of uh, my, my final words for, for my brothers and sisters here in Kenya, in Nairobi, I want to go back and pick on something that you said a little bit earlier and just uh, give it a little bit of tweaking, tweaking. You see, we have celebrities. Yes, we do. Celebrity, when I looked up the word in the dictionary, it means a famous person, someone famous. But unfortunately, that word is used in the pop industry, music industry, etc. So it's become a word that is synonymous with that which is entertainment. So to use the term celebrity when it comes to Islam leaves a slight bad taste in the mouth because of reducing it to mere entertainment when it isn't or it shouldn't be so i want to tweak it by saying if you and this is going to be some point of learning that can go down in history inshallah whenever you learn the deen from someone understand that it is the message you are more interested in rather than the person who brought it so don't glorify me as an individual if you like the way i put things across no problem. You pray for me and pray for others too. If you like the recitation of a specific Imam, and maybe the recitation of others might not inspire you in the same way or touch you because maybe you like a specific tone or tune, there is nothing wrong in having a favorite reciter of the Quran. And we all do, and I do too. And for your information, my favorite changes every time I hear another person who perhaps, uh, you know, touches a chord within me. Okasha Kimene is a powerful reciter. Have you heard of him? Go and check him out. Really, his recitation touches me. Raad al-Kurdi, his recitation touches me. For example, originally, I was a fan of Saad al-Ghamidi. Before that, I was a student of Sheikh Ali al-Hudayfi, for example, and so on. But when it comes to the speech and the lectures and the teaching the same rule applies you might have a favorite a favorite lecturer because when he talks to you maybe he inspires you maybe he motivates you to do good and maybe someone else might not be your favorite because they make you feel so unacceptable they make you feel like you're already burning in hell there's no harm in having a favorite for as long as that favorite is taking you closer to allah and not to himself 
So the day I come and promote my own self, that's the day you go away from me. Because the only reason why you know me, let's face facts, is because of the deen. If I was promoting anything else, we would not know each other. Do you agree? So let's keep it that way. Let the deen be of motivation. There's no harm if someone is famous for the right reasons. No harm. There's no harm if you want to go to a specific lecture and you do not want to go to another lecture. There's no harm. Actually, those who say that you have to go to every lecturer, they are wrong. The reason why they are wrong is there are so many who doom us. I personally and they themselves who claim that you got to go to everyone. They have their own favorites. They have their own people who they love listening to. Why? When I listen to this person, I feel like being a better Muslim. I feel like being a better human being. Nothing wrong. So I don't like to actually use the term celebrity to refer to Islam and the Muslims. And I also need to make it clear that when we do attend, the idea should be to obey the instruction of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to become closer, to be softened. You know, there is a lot I could say, but uh, that much in, inshallah is a good enough dose for today. Getting back to Kenya, beautiful place, lovely safari, mashallah. Although I haven't personally been, but I am encouraged because of the, the, the very beloved person who is seated on my right, have, uh, you know, being in a very strategic position regarding tourism, it would only be correct if I also gave the lions of this nation a bit of a show, inshallah. You know, so the next time, inshallah, we'll have our session a perhaps Masai Mara inshallah may Allah make it easy there we are I got it will it be fully sponsored Sheikh? oh wow you heard that guys you heard it you know they say strike when it's hot it was hot we struck Sheikh mashallah mashallah beautiful nation please build it please build bridges please mend relations please live with everyone in harmony and peace never let anyone make you become a vehicle of destruction don't let anyone convince you that your religion teaches you to destroy and harm because it doesn't. Wallahi, we are fortunate to be here and living in harmony. If we are going to disturb the peace, we are all going to pay the price of it in the same way that the others are paying a price today across the globe. Just flick the news channel and watch it. Don't go there. Don't. Be sensible. The most sensible people are those who see others destroying themselves and they protect themselves. I'm not going to do what they did. What did they do? Sectarian violence for nothing. Calling people kafirs for nothing. Destroying people because they belong to another faith for nothing. Be careful. If you start that way, I promise you, you will end in the, the same way. Look at what they did. You can be the strictest Muslim you want to be. Worship Allah and convey the message to others and that's it. You can never be stronger than the Nabi of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There were Jewish people he struck an agreement with in Medina Munawwara. There were people he lived with. When he passed away, you know his armor was given as collateral to a Jewish trader. So he traded with them too. Be careful how you look at others. Build your nation. Respect those who don't share your faith. Perhaps they are not belonging to the same sect as you. Like I said, it's your right to belong to what you feel is the best, but it is their right too. They might not be convinced. Who's going to be their judge? It's Allah. Maliki Yawmiddin, owner of the day of judgment. Why do you want to become an owner of judgment here? Every little while, these people don't deserve to live. Those people need to be harmed. Look at the bombings and the killings happening across the globe. In the name of the the one who told us to build. We are destroying in the name of the one who told us to build. In the name of the one who gave the life in the first place. Who gave the life? Allah. Who gives you the right to take that life away? He gave it. He is more powerful than you and I. If he wanted to take the life away, he could take it away. Why do you have to get involved in that negative way? Be careful. Don't let people confuse you to think that the more religious you are, the harsher you should become. No. A true sign of religiousness and piety is when you're softened. Like I said, those who are weak, listen, I just thought of something right now. 
Brother MC Sheikh Ibrahim asked a question about the cane. And what did I say? I said, when you use that corporal punishment, it is a sign of a weakness within yourself. The same applies to violence. When you use violence to, to try and compel people to what you believe, it's a sign you are so weak. It's a sign you are actually very, very weak. The problem is with you, not with them. You don't have the patience, the courage, the education to, to reach out to people positively. So you want to shove it down negatively. Subhanallah. We are facing the same problem inside our own religion. Don't let other people taste that type of so-called solution because it's not a solution. So this is my word to you as a nation. Please, please build the nation. Contribute towards it. Don't lose your Islamic identity. Don't. But remember, your identity itself is a da'wah. The more people who are convinced that Islam is a beautiful religion, the more kudos to you. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a good reward. Jazakumullah khair. Jazakumullah khair. I think with that note of do not destroy this nation, do not lose your identity, I think we want to end up there. We can listen to the Sheikh on and on and on, but we have to end it here. There is, now, something, there is something magnetizing about this crowd. And that is, I just feel like going on and on and on as well, mashallah. So silent, so patient, so beautiful, so mashallah, attentive. Are you noticing the same thing? Would you like to May come Allah back again? You. Would you like to come back again? No, I'd like to sit for longer right now. Say, inshallah. Inshallah. Can you bring your family here? Okay. Sheikh Najib is trying to convince me to create a family here. Uh, yeah, oh, create a family, yeah, mashallah. Up to four. No, you are allowed I, I, up to four. Brother, you are forgetting we are live on TV. Oh, thank you. You know, no you are forgetting the fact that I have uh, family members who are watching what I'm saying. Khair, inshallah. May thank Allah you. forgive me and may they, may they forgive me too, inshallah. Jazakallah khair. And with that note, <laughs> brothers and sisters, I think that has been a wonderful afternoon. We'd mashallah, like it to mashallah. go.